parenting can be either very challenging or it can be very good. I, it, it depends on the people, the two parents. Um, if you have one parent who is just still bitter and hell bent on making your life hard, then they're gonna use that opportunity, that experience to make your life a living hell. Yeah. So I reached out to this person. I said, hey, I'm in this situation. The retainer for my attorney is $3,500. I don't have a dime to my name right now. Can you please help me? And it was literally like a SOS email. And the next day, got an email back, said, that's fine, I'll contact your attorney tomorrow and get it done. And they did. And that's how the ball went rolling. But I will always say, you know, have something that you have that is, is of your own. And so my therapist challenged me. She said, Aldi, you know, I, I wonder if that list is still valid. And I said, you know, I should go back and look at it. And sure enough, I went back and looked at the list and there were things on there that were not valid anymore. And you have to think about that, ladies and men. Mm -hmm. uh, when you create these lists, it's at a moment in time. It's at a, a literally a moment in time, a season in your life. So either if you move forward and you're growing, that list should either grow too. It should should change too. There should be some type of like ebb and flow with it. What's up, Bravehearts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of his scary to remarry, wanting you to love fearlessly. We have a special guest with us today. I'm excited about this segment because you know how passionate about I am about marriage and, and, and divorce and going through that whole process, you know, like it's so much that goes into it. And today's guest, we're going to discuss some of these things. As I said before, as you've seen in my Instagram stories, we're going to discuss everything you need to know about court custody and co-parenting. Today's guest is a mom of three teenagers who spent 12 years battling in the family court system. And we're going to talk about so much more in depth. Bravehearts, Bravehearts community, let's show some love to Alby McNair. How are you doing this evening, Alby? Yeah, that's when the, the cue, the, the fake up <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I am good. I am good. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. As I was going through... Uh, your bio and, and and just doing some more homework on you. Can you just talk to us about your process? Because I see there's four family court trials, 30 family court hearings. Like there's so many different things, over $100,000 in legal fees. Can you, can you just kind of give us a little uh, background story to all that and how you actually were able to navigate through that? Yeah. So like most people, um, I felt like the writing was on the wall. I was married 11 years. Um, during that time, there was obviously good times and bad times, but realized that this, this wasn't going to work for myself and my family. And so I decided that I had a choice really to make. Either I stayed in this relationship or I got out and tried to make it on my own. So I made the decision that I thought was best. And I still do think it was the best um, to go ahead and, and file for dissolution, which is divorce. Um, I knew it would probably be a little rocky <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Um, but I had no idea that filing that piece of paper would take me 12 years through the family court system. If anybody would have told me that, actually, I had somebody tell me that the other day, they said, had you known that it would have taken you through this ordeal, I don't think you would have done it. And I probably wouldn't have, honestly. Mm. Um, it's been an ordeal and I did not see that coming. Um, but at the same time, I do believe I'm a woman of faith. And so I do believe that God allows you to experience things so you can have that experience to help somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of moments where I'm like, okay, God, like this is, this is year six. This is trial number three. Like, how much more do you want me to learn here? Like, how much more is there to know about the family court system? And every single time I thought I was done, back in court. 
back in Korea and I was learning something new. So it wasn't something that I sought out. Um, it was not something that I planned. It just happened. And again, with the family court system, emotions are high. And if you really don't know what you're getting into, you can, you can easily fall into that trap. I have clients right now who have been in the system for multiple years. It's easy to fall into that trap. And that's why I'm just going to make a little quick plug here. I started my own online course called the Divity Academy. It's to help people prepare with Stan and overcome the family court system. Are you a content creator, YouTuber? Maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really, really good. Or maybe you said something that was really, really good. Well, enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I want to share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram Reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and let you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you. So with the Divity Academy, it's really to help people prepare, withstand, and overcome the family court system. Um, but I really focus on that prepare piece because if you're prepared for it, the less time you're going to be in there and the less money that you're going to spend. So I am excited to have launched that. Um, please check it out. I'm sure Sean will, will share the, the handle for that. Yes, for sure. We'll have all that linked up in the description below. So those who want to purchase and support, because you just never know what someone is going through with divorce. And I'm sure with 12 years, you have yeah. a, a extended amount of wisdom and how to help someone navigate through that. Yeah. And actually, it's it's all. <laughs> yeah. And, and save money. And save money. Right. <laughs> how was after 12 years, what was the mindset like for you going through that process? Like it had to be exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. It was now that I look back at it, mm -hmm. I really was in what they would call a survival mode. I, I literally was trying to survive, um, taking care of three young kids. My daughter, when we started this process, she was two years old. Mm -hmm. Today, she's 16. So she was basically raised in the family court system, right? When you've seen multiple custody evaluations, custody evaluations aren't just for the parents. It's with the children. They're very much involved in a custody evaluation. So they've been the, through that three times. Um, I was, my sole focus was my children, obviously. You know, there's the, the, the analogy. It's really not an analogy. It was on the plane, you know, they said, put your mask on first and then, put it on your children. Well, for me, it was like, I need to get masked on my children and I'll worry about myself later. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very much survival mode. I don't know how I did it at times. Uh, I had a great support system. Again, being a woman of faith, I relied heavily on God. I didn't have a hundred thousand dollars at the time to spend on, on court. I was a stay at home mom for 11 years. And when I say stay at home mom, like Stay at home, mama. I was Susie homemaker, right? I, I made my kids' clothes. I cooked from scratch. Like I was that <laughs> that mom. Uh, wasn't working at the time. Didn't have any money to my name. I had to come up with over a hundred thousand dollars. So there were times where I didn't know how we were gonna make it. There were times where we didn't have food. People had to drop things off because there was no money. 
So it was very much survival mode um, during those years. And really my focus, like I said, was really trying to protect my kids. I did not want them to be another statistic. I did not want them to be, you know, that kid that's going to have trouble in school is going to, you know, drop out and be a menace. I, I did not want that. So my focus was really preparing my kids as well for what they were going to go through, but also trying to protect them. Yes. How, as I hear you talk, how, what is your advice to stay at home moms? Because there's a thing going on now in social media where, you know, social media, I, I know it's social media, but these are, these are things that, you know, you hear people say yeah. that they're in fear that mostly women are in fear of staying at home because they fear as if they, you know, whoever they're married to, they might not like trust the, uh, the, their husband as far as that power dynamic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. So I had my son, my first son, when I was really young, I say really young, I think I was about 23, 22, 23. Um, that was intentional. I, I, I knew I wanted to have my kids young. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have, Two are about to be out the door. And the last one, I got two more years. So I'm, I'm excited. And I was like, well, she still look good too. <laughs> you know, she thought that'd be an empty nester. She still looks good. That wasn't the plan. I thought I'd be still married, but I'm an empty nester and single. So anyway, <laughs> um, but that was not the plan. That was not the plan. Um, but for stay at home mom, so my child, I, I did not intend to be a stay at home mom. Uh, it's a funny story. Uh, my oldest, when he was an infant, and I don't know if this is common, but I call it cradle crap, but it's called cradle cap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just dry skin on the scalp. Well, I, as a new mom, I had no idea what to do, right? And so my mother-in-law at the time was watching him while I went back to work. I went back to work almost immediately, probably within three months. And I remember coming home and he was just dripping, in, in, in oil. And I said, what, what did you, what did you do? <laughs> and she said, well, I put olive oil on his head, you know, to break some of it up. And I was like, well, how do you know he's not allergic to olives? He could be allergic to olives. What if something happens? You know? And so after that, I kid you not, within probably a week or two, I put in my resignation and I said, you know what? I will stay at home with this child. Um, after that, another two kids came <laughs> right after that. I had them back to back their stair steps. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it was really, I didn't want to miss out on the first, right. I didn't want to miss out on their, their first step, you know, the first crawl, the first owie or anything like that. Um, but in knowing that I was staying home and, and putting my career on pause, I didn't really have a plan as to, well, how are you going to support the things that you want to do, right? How are you going to support? I've always had an entrepreneur spirit, right? And my, I'm super creative. Um, and it, there's things that I wanted to do, but it was just like, well, no, you know, you stay at home, mom. You just cook, clean, and take care of these kids, mm -hmm. right? That's 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 your job. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I was like, huh? I never thought about <laughs> this long term. It was. A, a emotional decision in a temporary moment because my child looked like a scene at a soul glow, right? <laughs> or at a coming to America, a soul glow a commercial, right? And so I was like, this, I didn't really think this through. Mm -hmm. Had I thought it through, I probably would have, and this is some of the advice for women who may want to stay at home with their kids or are staying at home with their kids, mm -hmm. or even some of the dads, right? We live in a in a generation now and at and, and at a time where that is okay, it's always been okay, but now it's socially okay, right? Yes. It's acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, but try to find something that you can own. And I'm not saying like run a full fledged business. If you want to, go right ahead. Go right mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but just something that you can own, that you can grow that you can possibly see some type of um, income coming in, passive income coming in. Um, I don't 
know how people feel about, you know, the finances and you didn't divide it 50, 50, or this is my money, this is your money. And then we have the pot in the middle, whatever you decide, but make sure you have something for yourself. Uh, no one goes into a marriage saying, okay, I know this is going to last only about three years. So I'm going to calculate. No one does that, right? You, you go into it for the long haul. However, things happen. Things happen. So you want to have that safety net. In my situation, I had no safety net. You know, I, I remember there was an incident that happened and I it's like, I got to get out of here. I emailed a friend of mine from when I was 15 years old. <laughs> I went way back. Yeah. Because I didn't know who else to reach out to. I couldn't reach out to my family because at the time they didn't know what was going on. Mm. My friends knew somewhat, but I didn't want to expose that to them. So I reached out to this person. I said, hey, I'm in this situation. The retainer for my attorney is $3,500. I don't have a dime to my name right now. Can you please help me? And it was literally like a SOS email. And the next day, got an email back, said, that's fine. I'll contact your attorney tomorrow and get it done. And they did. And that's how the ball got rolling. But I will always say, you know, have something that you have that is, is of your own. Mm -hmm. um, and again with the finances it should be something that is discussed it should be something that each person has access to mm -hmm. there should be one person's name on the account and your money's going in there too I got a problem with that yeah I, got, I will say that <laughs> um but it needs to be the expectations need to be there they need to be open and clear mm -hmm. um especially if one is the breadwinner and one is taking care of the kids. Yeah. That's no, that's wisdom because I'm such a fan of it now as far as, you know, women being at home, wives being at home. Uh, if I know anything now and just from what I've learned looking back over my 47 years of life, I wish I would have have given my wife the option to work or stay at home. I won't say give, but you know, like, hey, you either want to work or you want to stay at home because raising young kids, I, I, it's a lot, you know. It's a job. Yes. It's, it's a very tough job. Um, mm -hmm. You got three lives that depend on you. Yes. You know? But they know their colors and ABCs. I remember just driving around, we had a, I called it a bus, but the extended uh, Escalade. And I was just like, what color is that over there? <laughs> you know, it's exhausting. It's, it's really exhausting. And then you get all the questions from them. You got to answer them. You take care of everything. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's, but at the same time, it's the most rewarding. Right? Yes. Because, you, you know, you could be raising the next president of the United States. Exactly. You know, you, you just never know. Yeah. I, I want to talk about co-parenting. Okay. What, what are your thoughts on co-parent especially while going through the divorce process or even after the divorce process or whatever you feel like can really help the viewers and the listeners as far as co-parenting in this in this whole process with divorce <laughs> i want to say you know if you're thinking about getting married think about that person as a co-parent <laughs> going into the marriage like right? how how good of a co-parent would this person be um but the, uh, it's it's funny because I think the national psych psychologist something association they say the definition for co-parenting is that it is an experience, <laughs> right? It's an experience between two parents, and I said, oh yeah, it it definitely is an experience like no other, mm -hmm. like no other. Mm -hmm. uh, co-parenting can be either very challenging. Or it can be very good. I, it, it depends on the people, the two parents. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one parent who is just still bitter and hell bent on making your life hard, mm -hmm. then they're going to use that opportunity, that experience to make your life a living hell. Um, then on the flip side, I've seen someone, I actually met a woman today um, at an event that I was at earlier. And she said that, with her ex, they have a great co-parenting relationship. 
She said, actually, I'm driving his car right now because my car is in the shop and he dropped it off. He, she said, we talk every day. Um, so it, it can be two extremes. It really can be two extremes. Uh, the one thing I would say, if it is a, um, a, a, cont I would say a contested yes. um, divorce, and then you, that most likely would lead to a contested type relationship with your co-parent. Keep it very simple. You do not have to engage them in every little fight yeah. or text or email. Um, for your own sanity, keep it very basic and about the kids. And that's it. If it has, if they send you a text or email and it has absolutely nothing to do with the kids, you are not required by law to respond to that. I learned that the hard way. The hard way meaning I learned that years after. And I would spend all this time going back and forth in emails when I didn't really need to. It was not even about the kids. And it took my therapist saying, now, where? show me where in your parenting plan order does it say you have to respond to this? They can't find it. I was like, yeah, because it's not there. It doesn't exist. So therefore, the conversation doesn't need to exist. And so... Finding just, you're going to have to figure out how to manage this new relationship. And I know it's a shock because when you go through a divorce, you don't go through a divorce thinking, okay, and now I have to have, you know, enter into daily communication or, or, or spend more time with this person. You're thinking, it's my way out. Deuces. Y'all just see you no more. Get out my life. And then when you have children, it's like, oh, no, you got to stay here for, until at least they're 18 or yeah. they graduate, right? Whichever one's mm -hmm. later. So you're stuck with that person. And that's the hard reality with co-parenting because you're thinking after the divorce, you get your decree, you get your decree number mm -hmm. and you're on your way. No, ma'am. And no, sir. No, you didn't. Now you enter into that experience called co-parenting <laughs> and you're going to have to find ways to manage that and manage how much time and attention that you put into that relationship. It can work. It can be a beautiful thing. I've seen it. Um, just, it hasn't happened in my case. I wish it had, yeah. um, but I've seen it work beautifully. And it, when it does, it benefits the children. Mm -hmm. It benefits the children. The one thing I harp on and it's is throughout my course, my course is 12 sessions, um, 12 videos. I harp on it, especially the custody evaluation portion. I say the one thing that you can do if you are co-parenting or at dealing with the custody evaluation is to make sure your kids feel two things, safe and loved, period. If you focus on that, you shouldn't have any issues. Yeah. You really shouldn't have any issues with yeah. co-parenting. You just have to put your feelings aside. Mm -hmm. you, can't be you know, you can't because that's going to make the relationship. That's going to make your your divorce feel like it's never ending mm -hmm. because it's constant going back and forth, bickering about this, bickering about that. Then don't let someone break the order. Then you get back in court. I'm talking about myself here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Now you see how, because a lot of people are like, how did you spend 12 years constant fighting back and forth after the divorce is over? Constant fighting back and forth. So do yourself a favor, get your decree, sit down, love your kids, make sure they're safe and go about your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And I want to piggyback off of that because there was a reel that you created that said two words you should never say in a custody battle. Yeah. That reel was so good. Uh, and you said oh, our children. Yes. And yeah. and I, and I'm 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 guilty of it, right? Because you go to court and you, my child, my and when you say it, when you said that in the video, I was like, oh, that makes sense because it it, it it brings a, a a unity kind of thing. Like, let's make this work for our children opposed to mine's or yours. Um, so I, I appreciate that video. That was really good. I wish I would have used it when I was going through my divorce. Yeah. And it's just not, 
test the evaluations. You should go into it, even when you're if you're writing a declaration or an affidavit. Our it's always our children. It's not mine, not my. It is our. Okay, mm -hmm. right? you, you you made that unless you a new age Mary. <laughs> you know you made that child with somebody else, and it's called the other parent. Um, and that's something that I've seen judges, they do not like that because it in, insinuates that you think that you're the only parent involved here. And so they're going to assume that you're probably not going to involve this other parent. You're probably not going to allow them to be involved in their children's life, i.e. co-parenting, right? So when they hear that a lot, mine and my, they already feel like you're dismissing this other parent. So it they frown at it. They don't like it. Um, most attorneys will coach you and, and tell you, hey, don't say my or mine. It's, it's our children. And it is. That's true. Yeah. Oh, I wish I knew you years ago, Albie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most common common response that I get whenever I do a session yeah. or a mentor session with someone. They just said, you know, I wish I would have known you a long time ago or before I, they just went to a hearing and they were like, you know, I wish I would have met you before this hearing. It's like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about the number one dating mistake singles make after divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that and and, and what is let's it? Unpack that. <laughs> let's, let's unpack that, please. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it, it's you go through these different phases of a divorce, right? Um, I I tell all my clients, and they some of them listen to me, some of them don't. But my advice is, you should wait a year after your divorce is finalized. That means it has been entered into court. The judge has signed it. On that date, that's when the year starts. Not prior. Because technically, you're still married if it's prior. But on that date that it is signed, ink is dry, on that date, you should do a one-year probation. And the reason why I say that is because you have just gone through a lot. It was emotional and it was traumatic. And I don't care if it was amicable. You still, a divorce is a loss. My, um, the one of the forensic psychologists that was assigned to our case, he said, I told him, I said, you know, when I got the call, I had to leave our family home. I kind of fled actually um, when my ex was served. And so when I got that call, I was driving on the highway going to stay with my sister and I got the call and I cried and it was pouring I'm from Seattle. So it was pouring that day. And I cried the same way I cried when I got the call that my my grandmother um, was had passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I told him that he said, yeah, Alvi, statistically, there's research that says a divorce brings about the same emotion as a close relative's death. And I said, huh because I cried the exact same way. Um, and so you, you're still dealing with the death of a relationship, right? And I, I also tell my mentees, it's, I don't, it's not mandatory and I don't require it, but I, I really push it hard to get into therapy, just to work through and break up anything that might be there that you weren't aware that was there. Um, so, you know, after that, then you enter the dating pool and see what's out there. Yeah. But my experience is not much. <laughs> but you can know you can go out there and see what's out there. Yeah. Um, I've had since gosh, okay, so gosh, it's been a long time since I've been divorced. Um, I can count on one hand how many you know serious relationships I've had. I think there was only two that I felt could go all the way. Mm -hmm. Um but even with those, they didn't, obviously they didn't pan out. Uh, but just recently I started to do kind of the real work on myself. Like I said before, I was so focused on my children and this is when I can say my children, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
I was very focused on my children and making sure that they were in therapy and that they would survive this, right? I, I'll be fine, but I need to make sure these kids who are small and don't understand what the hell's going on, that they survive. So I finally focused on myself. And so I've been working with therapists um, for the last almost two years uh, and just in dating and going out and, and, and seeing what's out there. Um, I realized <laughs> that, you know, what I used to believe was my standard may have changed. And, and she really helped me to see that. Um, there was a, a situation um, where I, I call it the experiment, right? <laughs> the experiment, because this is, so I call it that the Alvi 1.0 and then you have Alvi 2.0. I'm in the 2.0 right now. So the Alvi 1.0, she's a little obnoxious. Like, <laughs> she's like, she she liked all the the, the trauma bonding and, and the love bombing and all. she liked that stuff. But the, the Alvi 2.0 is like, mm -hmm that's not healthy. You know, that's not really not a healthy way to love. And so they clash a lot. Um, but I had a, what I call an experiment and I mentioned it to my therapist and I said, you know, I had this list, right? Most, most women, do men have lists? Do you guys write lists? Do men have lists? And a, and a spouse. Men don't really have lists. We, yeah, it's simple. Football. We we have like three things. Three things. Yeah, three. Body. What about the eyelash thing going on? Oh, I've just mm. been. Mm. Uh -huh. No, nah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, body. Body. Ooh, let's say let's say physical attraction, right? Body. You know, the physical attraction has to be there. Uh, the second one is: is she, does she respect me? Is she, are we agreeable? Uh, I think that's a big one for men because without respect, you can be the finest woman in the world. Um, and it's out the window. Yeah. Uh, the third one, from men that I know, mostly, you know, Christian men, and I have different faiths that listen and stuff like that. But for the most part, like their relationship with God, like, I, you know, say that she, does she have like a reverence for God? Does she love God? That whole thing, you know, uh, the Pope Proverbs 31 woman. And I'm just throwing on my air quotes, but just that relationship with God. I think a lot of men that that I know more Christian based, like those are like those three big ones. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So anyway. All right. Yes. I always, I was like, because I had a list. <laughs> my list was... Uh, probably three times your list. <laughs> but I, I started with, of course, God, right? Um, Got to have a relationship with God, know God, love God. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes all the way down to number 21. So yes, there was, <laughs> there was 21 items on this list. And I actually showed it to a male friend of mine, very good friend of mine. And he said, let me see this list. And so I showed him the list and he reads them off to me. And looks at me and keeps reading. And then he types in number 22. And he says, basically, I'm looking for Jesus. Literally, that's what it says, number 20, 22. I'm looking for Jesus. <laughs> so I, I should have known at that time that the list probably wasn't very realistic. But I said, you know, I'm going to keep praying on it. Because, you know, I serve a big God who can do mighty things, right? He you may desires, the other day desires of your heart. Yeah, ladies. Your husband can't protect you if you keep what spending all the money. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah. Oh, Alvi did. Yeah, it was that was that was tough. I people were coming for me. Yeah, and I said, but he can do all things to Christ who strengthens him. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, he can. He can. He can manage it. And while I'm down at Neiman Marcus, he can manage it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm looking at the list and there's now there's 22 items, right? The last one being I'm looking for Jesus. Um, and so my therapist challenged me. She said, Alvi, you know, I, I wonder if that list is still valid. And I said, you know, I should go back and look at it. And sure enough, I went back and looked at the list and there were things on there that were not valid anymore. And you have to think about that, ladies and men. Mm -hmm. uh, 
when you create these lists, it's at a moment in time. It's at a, a literally a moment in time, a season in your life. So either if you move forward and you're growing, that list should either grow too. It should should change too. There should be some type of like ebb and flow with it. Um, I thought it would just be the same, but I created that list years ago. I know years ago, I was not where I'm at today as far as my healing journey, um, as, as far as what I desire in myself, right? It's about those desires in yourself first before you can go and look to get those desires in somebody else, right? And that was the hard look for me. I had to look at that list and it's like, well, Abby, do you do you do this? Yeah. Um, do you do that? Where where's 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 your how's your four hundred one k looking? Like I had four hundred one k on there, um, <laughs> but how's your four hundred one k looking? Yeah. You know, so I had to understand that at that time, I was in survival mode. You know, for the last, I would say, fifteen years, I've been in survival mode. So the the things that I felt I needed in life was to support me in that. But now that I'm outside of what my, I've gone through, and I really do feel like this last, I was just in court in September. Um, and one thing that I said, and even my ex, and we never agree on anything, right? <laughs> he said, this is something that we actually agree on. I don't want to come back here. And I was like, I don't want to come back here either. He's like, yay, we finally got after all this time. One thing that we agree on. So I was hoping that, you know, this is it. And we, we won't be back. Um, but it's, I feel like I'm outside of this, this ordeal now, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or whatever reason God gave me 12 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I always say too, with that 12 years, I've, I've done everything you could possibly do in the family court system. There is no question that I cannot answer about your case and help you through. So I understand it now why God made me go through it for so long. Yeah. Um, at the time I didn't, I, I really thought God, I was like, well, we're not, we're really not homies. I talked to God like that. Like, you know, we're really not homies. I thought we were homies, but apparently we're not because you keep taking me through this ordeal, right? Um, but now that I'm outside it, I can kind of take a step back and see that was a season. And that was the old Alvi. Mm -hmm. And the old Alvi had, again, needs and desires that she either doesn't need anymore because she fulfills it for herself or she has outgrown that need or that desire. So that, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That is so good because going through a divorce, if you have this list, you're in that season. Season. Yes, you are. Yeah, so it's almost like if someone is in a relationship and say uh, the person they're with is cheating, they get out of that relationship. The number one priority that they're looking for in the next person is as long as they don't cheat. Yeah. Right. You know, when, when there's so much more that can be addressed. So the person that you are going through that process opposed to say a year from now, you're going to look at life through a different lens because your heart is in a different place, or at least should be, right? Yeah. So. And then that with getting actual actual mental health care, right? Even if you you can't, I understand it's expensive and not all mental health professionals take insurance. I get that. But even if you just took the time to yourself, right? Um, to understand who you are now, your, your, your wants, the things that you've never, if you weren't allowed or, you know, you didn't have the time to do things before, now you do, you know, you're, you're, you're exploring, you're discovering new things, have that time, you know, to, to do that. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to date. <laughs> yeah. There really are. There, there, there are plenty of opportunities out there to meet people and who I call experiment. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. So yeah. It's, there's really no reason to rush into it. And I would challenge, and again, I am not a therapist. I say that in every single video. I'm not a therapist. I'm not an attorney. However, I've I've learned that over the years, and, and I'm speaking for myself here, that 
I I used to say, well, I just, I love being in a relationship because I really love companionship. Well, that's an attachment, right? We can, we can, that's a whole nother episode. We can yeah, talk about not, attachment yeah. style. Yeah. But it's an attachment that you have. Now, is it a secure attachment? This is a, a plug for that, the book, Attached, I think it was called. The avoidant. It's avoidant, right. Mm -hmm. Like, discover that. If yeah. anything, if you don't get a therapist during that year, at least read that book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and understand what type of attachment do you have? Because that was, for me, I was like, wow, I have a problem of being alone. Mm -hmm. And why is that? So I'm finally in this space and in this season once I, I, I dealt with that, where I'm just like, oh, you know, I, I kind of really enjoy being, I'm a really cool person, yeah. <laughs> you know? I enjoy being alone. I enjoy, <laughs> I mean, I rock out with myself. You know, no, that's right. Have a whole conversation. And I, I'm like, she real cool. <laughs> I, I like Alvy. She's cool. Like my, I enjoy this new Alvy. Yes. Alvy 2.0. Alvy 2.0. <laughs> Alvy, we're going to jump into this bonus round. So this is Alvy Uncut. So this is a little more fun, a little more laid back, you know. These um, are not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and these are Alvy two point questions, not okay. Alvy. Good. <laughs> okay. That's what is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Ah, <sighs> that's a good one. Um, I <laughs> I think women tend to believe that if someone has potential that they can come in and um, help, quote, help yeah. um, that person. But in my experience, if that person doesn't have it, <laughs> there's a reason that they don't have it. So that potential, you might be working at that potential for a year, two, three, 10, 15, 20, and that person's just not going to get there. So, I, I, in my opinion, that's one of the, the biggest, one of the biggest, there's others, um, mistake that I see with women. Um, we, we think we can come in and, and, and fix somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm at a stage now, I don't want to, I don't want to fix anybody. Now, do I want us to grow together? Absolutely. But I don't want to come in and fix. Yeah. I don't want to come to the table already fixed. <laughs> come to the table fixed. That'd be great. I, I hear you. From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? What did my past relate? Say that again. What's the question? But from seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? So my parents' relationship, um, they got a divorce when I was young, so I was probably about four or five mm -hmm. um, when they got a divorce. But they were still cordial to one another. So I remember my dad coming over to pick me up for visitation, right? We didn't call it visitation then. But he would come and pick me up and sit down at the kitchen table and talk to my mom for like an hour about family drama, you know, the family gossip. And he, you know, they didn't, I never saw them argue. Um, mm -hmm. I never saw any type of abuse or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so although that didn't happen in my case, um, it, it's, it's something that I admired about them. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate to have next door, um, a wonderful family, um, which I, the husband and wife, I call them my godparents. And so I watched them and I remember telling them, uh, it was at my godfather's 70th birthday party. I think it was, um, I remember sharing that as a little girl, you didn't know this, but I used to watch you. Like I, I used to watch you. Um, I remember probably age nine that I was like, okay, I, one day I want a family and I want to be married. Um, but I, I want a husband that looks like that. Mm. And I want to be a wife that looks like that. So I'm grateful that I had that example right next door. I mean, I spent all my time over there. Yeah. Um, they treat me as a daughter, you know, and so it was awesome just to have that that example. Of, okay, this is what a godly husband and father looks like, and this is what a godly 
mother and wife looks like. Mm. And so I try to imitate, you know, what she did and just even having that type of relationship. Yeah, that's beautiful. Who makes a better spouse? Someone who never married or someone divorced? Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, that's number 11 on the list. <laughs> so number really? 11. Yeah. Number 11. I don't know if it's number 11. Mine would be number 9, 10, or 15. Yeah, yeah. But it says, must have been married and must have their own children. Because she's done. Again, I'm, I'm still young and I feel like, you know, I don't go to the club. But I was like, if I wanted to go to the club, I think I can go. Probably runs into my oldest son and his friends, but I'm still young, and I'm I, even though I'm young, I'm I'm not having any more children. Like it's, it's shut down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the reason behind the children piece. The marriage piece was because I felt at the time again that was a period of time survival. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If he was already married before and it failed for whatever reason, mm -hmm. at least he had the experience already. At least he understood what it mm -hmm. requires. At least he understood that you can't just open the door and walk out. Mm -hmm. You got to close the door, turn around and face that person <laughs> that you're sick of. Yeah. Right? That you were able to just strangle. I have a post tomorrow that will complement this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it was a requirement because I wanted them to be able to, to, to know what it takes mm -hmm. to make a marriage work. If you've never been in a marriage, I assumed you didn't know what it took to make that marriage work and, and, and the struggle, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a struggle. Now, can we get an amen? Amen. <laughs> It's a struggle. Yes. However, 2.0 Alvi, mm -hmm. that matters. None of that matters. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I say up front, I'm done with kids. Again, I have three beautiful children. Mm -hmm. I love them dearly. They're amazing kids. Yeah. Um, so that's not an option. Um, but whether they've been married before or not has nothing to do with me. It has yeah. absolutely nothing to do with me. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. This is a multiple choice question. <laughs> What's harder for you to say? I apologize. I need help. I love you. Or I was wrong. Wow. It's multiple choice. So multiple choice as in as, we like all or just one? As, yeah, just one. The, the, the hardest one that you struggle with is it I apologize. I need help. I love you. I was wrong. It's number two, I believe. I need help. Is that number two? May you expound on that, please? <laughs> um, I am a giver at heart. I have a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. So it is easy for me to give. It is very hard for me to receive and ask for help. Mm -hmm. uh, I struggle with that. And like I said before, having to come up with thousands of dollars I remember there was times where my attorney was threatening to to withdraw from the case by Friday if I didn't come up with ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I had no money. Mm -hmm. I, I literally had to beg and ask, and it was the most humbling <laughs> experience yeah. Yeah. to come up with that money. Um, it, divorce, especially when it's high contested, and if you get into a custody battle. The, the amount can be ridiculous, as you see in my case. Um, and you're going to have to have a strategy as to how you're going to fund this, this legal battle. Um, for me, it was really hard in asking for help. In my relationships, um, is equally still hard. Um, my last serious relationship was with someone um, who most would say was highly successful. Um, we did a lot of things together, traveled all over the world, just highly successful. But there was times where it was like, I don't know how to make ends meet. And I still wouldn't ask. And I know he would have been given it to me. 
Yeah. And then it was one day I was talking to a friend and he kept calling and I said, I finally answered and he's like, well, what are you guys talking about? And I was like, well, we're talking about this specific situation. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, why are you guys talking about that? And I said, because it's real as single mothers, this is what we go through and there's no money. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, how much money do you need? Wow. It was hard for me. It was seriously, and I kept stuttering. He was like, just tell me the number. Yeah. So I threw the number low ball. He's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll sell it to you right now. Wow. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> you go through all this stress and there's people I truly believe and I've seen it in my experience. God places people in your life to support you, whether it's financially, emotionally, mentally, physically, whatever. Um, there was people that were, solely in my life to say here's a hundred dollars or here's forty thousand dollars i want you to see i want to see you and your kids survive this you know um but for me man asking for help man i'd rather <laughs> die by the you know a thousand paper cuts first before i have to ask anybody for anything i god's still working with me i i get it totally understand is it is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Well, again, okay, so Abby 1.0. Abby 2.0 would say someone else. Abby 2.0 would say myself. Um, I would say it's easier. I would still say it's, it's easier to, to love someone else. I'm pretty hard on myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wanting to give myself more grace. Yeah. Um, I've been through a lot. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people could see my strengths. Sometimes I can't, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I'm a lover at heart. Um, and one of my my children is just like that. Yeah. And so I love showing, you know, I it's like what's your love language? Well, I like all five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like doing all five. <laughs> You know, you tell me which one, which is your two, and we're good because yeah. I got, you. you know, so I'm one of those people that is just like, I, I love for a person to know how much they're loved. Mm -hmm. Love it. What's the best part about being Albie? You keep rolling with these questions, huh? Um, <laughs> the best part of being Albie, um, right now it's just, I'm in a season of my life, man, where I call it the 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 restoration phase, you know, or the redemption phase. Uh, one of my prayers when I was going through this ordeal was, God, please reverse, return, and restore everything that I lost. Mm. Everything. Mm. Um, he's done that. Yeah. Um, there's still more to go. I remind him every day, like, hello, Lord, my finances. <laughs> Don't forget about the finances, God, right? Um, and he's restoring. That's why I, I have this amazing academy. The academy is not about restoring my finances, though. It's about helping others to not lose their finances, right, in their mind. Yes. Um, but I'm just in this amazing season of my life where I feel like I finally, when I was going through that the family court system, I always used to tell people, close people and myself, I'm like, I don't even know what peace feels like. Like, I wonder, I used to literally sit there at night and just look up and be like, I wonder what it would feel like to feel like just peace, like peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm in that season where mm -hmm. it's very peaceful. And I'll tell people, you know, don't, don't, don't come over here. I, I, my analogy is I finally have, have, crossed over right mm -hmm. and now it's from the thorns now i'm in the green pastures and it's beautiful and there's flowers blooming and there's colors and it's it's calm and it's peaceful and i tell you don't don't come over here messing up trampling on my water <laughs> because i'll cut you out like i will cut you i will cut you out. um i've waited so long for this moment you yeah. know yeah like i've waited so long to just experience peace and mm -hmm. I I feel like I'm in that season right now yeah um, will there be things that come along and, and struggles and challenges yeah every day of course yeah life of course yeah. um yeah. but I love this 
new Albie, the Albie 2.0. Yeah, for sure. This has been a phenomenal episode. Albie, I want to acknowledge you for everything that you do for people that's going through a divorce, like helping people in this process, because there's so many people that's they're not educated in this area, or at least they don't they don't know, you know, just out of ignorance and just for you to share your story with the world. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge you for that. I want to acknowledge you for staying the course with your kids and also just being humble. I want to acknowledge you for that as well, because I know there's been challenges and uh, it can be easy to kind of, you know, be on your high horse like I did it kind of thing. But I feel like you have a humble uh, sweet spirit. So I want to acknowledge you for those things. So thanks again for being a guest. Can you let everyone know how they can get in touch with you? Can you tell us everything that you have going on? I'll have everything linked up in the description below. Yeah. So Divity Academy is my online course. It's 12 sessions. You can also purchase the bonus section, um, which has all the bonus videos. I'm actually getting ready to start recording a course, a mini course on relocation. It's one question I get a lot. I, again, I've done it all right in the family court system. Um, relocation was one. It's very hard to relocate out of a state with children. Um, I did it. I filed. I won. It's again, very rare, but I want to share my strategy on how I did that. That will be available in the bonus course. Um, Divity Academy, you can find it online at www.divity D-I-V-O-D-Y.com. I was told today, someone asked me, whoa, Divity, what does that mean? Is it a play on divorce? And I said, actually, it is. How did you know that? <laughs> and she said, well, I just took a guess. But she was like, I think you should let people know why or how you create that name. So this is the first time I'm going public with it. But Divity is a name that I came up with. It's actually some French name, the way you say it. But um, I took divorce, D-I-V, and divorce, and then the last three letters in custody, O-D-Y, and I put them together. So if you cannot remember Divity, <laughs> remember <laughs> divorce and custody, the first three letters in divorce, last three letters in custody, and you'll have it. Um, that's where you can find me on Instagram. You can also find me there at the T-H-E Divity, D-I-V-O-D-Y. Mm. Well, you heard it here first, Brave Arts community. Make sure you connect with Alvi. As you can tell, this has been a phenomenal episode. So make sure you go and connect with her. Make sure you get the course and everything because she's out here helping people. Thank you so much for your time, Alvi. This has been a phenomenal episode. In addition to the course, I also do mentoring. So that's where I started. People heard my story and they just started sending me people. So I have been mentoring for the last probably three years. Mm -hmm. um, I have several students. They're amazing. Um, I also offer, it's a one hour uh, mentor session that you can book, mm -hmm. or I also offer a free 30 minute session. Awesome. And it and that's on which, okay, cool. Okay. Well, we'll make sure we have all that together. Thank you for letting us know because mentorship is very important. I would not be the person that I am today without mentorship. So thank you for offering that for the community as well to those who will see this video on YouTube. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of It's Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video.